Welcome to a bird's eye view, a spotlight on faculty teaching excellence. We are excited to be here to share remote learning best practices of your very own colleagues here at Broward College. My name is Michelle Levine. I'm the District Director of Faculty Development in CTEL. Hi, my name is Belinda Meridian and I'm the District Director for Instructional Design. Belinda and I will be co-hosting this webinar series. Joining us today is our co-host, Dr. David per Perdian. Dr. David C. Perdian received his PhD in analytical chemistry from Iowa State University and joined the faculty at Broward College in 2010. Since 2016, he has served as the faculty development coordinator for CTEL on North Campus. A fun fact about Professor Perdian is David enjoys running and he has ran three marathons so far. Today, we are pleased to welcome our faculty guest, Dr. Russell Betts from the STEM Pathway. Thanks, uh, Michelle and Belinda. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Russell Betts. Uh, Professor Betts graduated from Wayne State University with a PhD in organic chemistry. We have been at uh, Broward College North Campus uh, Science Department since 2011. Uh, a, fun back, a fun fact about uh, Professor Betts is uh, since joining uh, the faculty, uh, Russ has earned a Lean Six Sigma green belt, uh, learned to scuba dive, started running 5K races, and is currently learning how to speak Spanish. I would also like to add that Dr. Betts credits Dr. Perdian for his newfound love of running. Thank you both for joining us today. Okay, let's get started with our first question. Uh, Dr. Betts, can you please describe some of the best practices that you have used to transition your courses to a remote environment? Uh, sure, uh, Dr. Perdian, thank you for asking. It's a great question. Uh, transitioning to the remote environment uh, for me really wasn't uh, as big a deal as some faculty because I was already uh, offering a lot of my content online. Uh, I would just say the best practices, at least from my opinion, and to teach chemistry, um, is to do a lot of things on YouTube, do a lot of my instructional things on YouTube. Um, I post all my uh, lectures are done on YouTube, and uh, all my lecture notes and all my lecture slides are available on my D2L shell. So I think just giving students uh, a video to learn from is a really awesome tool because uh, obviously they can stop it, rewind it, fast forward to what they already know. Uh, it's a really great tool. Also, I've come to learn that Blackboard Collaborate is actually a very nice tool for speaking with students um, in this remote environment. Uh, that way they can, you know, turn on their webcam, show me what they or they're working on on a piece of paper, and then I can kind of guide them from there. And Blackboard Collaborate also with uh, some of the tools it has just for uh, for uh, typing to each other on the whiteboard or drawing on the whiteboard is a, is a fantastic tool for teaching chemistry and, and science in general, I would think. Dr. Betts, I have a question. Do you create your own YouTube videos or do you curate them from the web? I create my own, actually. I, all my content is 100% mine. I sometimes do use the publisher's slides from the textbook, uh, just because the students are familiar with that. But uh, those videos are 100% mine. I have my own YouTube channel called All In With Dr. Betts, a shameless plug there. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Perdine and I have actually made our own uh, our YouTube channel together called uh, Faculty Media Creation Hub, where we post a lot of video, uh, post a lot of videos on how to actually make videos. Uh, for YouTube that we find that, that are engaging as well as informative for students to use. Excellent. Thank you. And what software are you using for that? I'm sorry, please repeat the question. What software do you use to create the videos? Uh, to create videos, I use a software package called Open Broadcast Software. It's, it's a freeware available online to anyone who wants to use it. Um, it's what it's the software that all the big YouTubers use. If you think of uh, the top YouTubers like uh, PewDiePie is uh, close to the number one YouTuber. Uh, any video game YouTuber uses it, um, and it's. It, I, I guess my philosophy is if the number one guy on YouTube uses it, then it must be a really good piece of software. So I downloaded it, started playing with it, found that it was very intuitive to make a really cool, engaging video. And I also use uh, iMovie to edit all my video, and I use a program called Audacity to edit the sound if I need to do any sound editing. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, Dr. Betts, I know that uh, creating your uh, all these uh, videos on uh, yourself is quite a bit of work, but uh, uh, do you think uh, students uh, respond to videos uh, that you make yourself 
um, more than say just a uh, another video uh, produced by someone else, um, whether it be you know another chemist or other uh, YouTuber. That's the really good question, actually. Um, th th I guess it would be a twofold answer. You know, you could think of it two different ways. Um, I think they respond well to videos that I make because they know me um, and they know I'm a, uh, even students who aren't in my lecture classes know that I'm a Broward faculty member. So they know that the information I'm giving them is relevant to their specific course. Um, whereas I'm probably not as engaging or as uh, personable, let's say, as a YouTube celebrity. I'm thinking um, of some of the science guys that are out there on YouTube. I, their names kind of escape me right now, but they have very, very engaging video. And if I do find one of their videos that's very engaging, I will uh, give it to my students for uh, for viewing because, you know, quite frankly, they're very entertaining. And sometimes just being entertaining is enough to get someone's interest. But I've had numerous students tell me that they find my videos to be very helpful, not only because um, the content is there and they can rewind and fast forward, uh, but because they can see me and they they can see that I'm engaging with them. Um, the it, it kind of just makes it more of an engaging atmosphere for a student. I know for myself when I'm learning how to do something on YouTube, usually it's home repair. Um, it's always nice to see the person talking and you can kind of almost feel like they're talking to you even though you know they're just talking to a camera. So it's kind of a two a twofold answer there. I'm not I'm not against using other people's content, um, but I do like to have my own. I think I think your students really connect to you because uh, of the fact that the videos are made by you, um, and I think it is definitely a big positive. Uh, and uh, I don't think you, you I don't think you need to sell yourself short. Your your videos are very engaging, Dr. Betts. Oh, thanks very much. I appreciate that. Dr. Betts, we would love to see firsthand how you're utilizing the virtual environment to deliver the content in your course. What is one practice you would like to share and demonstrate for us? Sure, thanks for the question. It's a really good question. And I think I'd like to share how to use uh, open broadcast software to show faculty and to highlight really how easy it is to use some of this free software that's out there and how it's fairly simple with, with basic computer equipment to make engaging YouTube videos. Um, basically with equipment you probably already have in your office. So I want to just bring up the OBS or a, a YouTube video actually of PewDiePie. He's a famous YouTuber. Here he is. So as you can see, here's the video game. He's playing Minecraft here. Um, and here he is in the corner and you can see him. You can see his face. You can see him reacting to the game. You can see him reacting to what he's playing in the game. And he actually has his own you know, monologues. He talks to himself a lot. He talks to the game a lot. It's, it's engaging. It's funny. Uh, and he's personable. Yeah. He has over 100 million subscribers. So I'm, I guess I didn't wow. want to argue with success, and I decided to do my videos in a similar fashion. So here's one of my videos here. Now, obviously, it's not a video game. It's not, not nearly as much fun. This is chemistry. So <laughs> David and I love it, but uh, most people won't. Uh, but you can see here I am in the bottom right-hand corner talking to the, to the students. And as the full screen, or most of the screen is occupied by the data they have to know. So it's almost like they're in the classroom with me, only they're sitting at home with their, with their phones or their devices. They're reading the slide, they're hearing my commentary, and I'm drawing on an iPad Pro at this point using a, a stylus in the iPad Pro to highlight things, draw structures, work out problems for the students so that that way um, they can see how to solve problems, do things like that. So I was gonna show you guys how to make videos look similar to this. That's just kind of how I was gonna, I got a lawnmower again in the background, but let me just keep going. And here's OBS. Here's what it looks like when you download it and start it. It looks pretty barren. Not much going on here. But it's really, really easy to set up to do a video like I do. Um, let me just uh, click on this plus button right here. And I'm going to bring my webcam in. I'm going to do what's called a video capture. And, and there it is. I guess you can't see it on your screen for some reason, but trust me, it's there. And now I'm just going to select basically my webcam. How did you learn how to use um, this tool? YouTube. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I see research on it. Great, I used, great. I used YouTube. And this is a free was, tool, correct? Uh, yes, OBS is absolutely free. So there yeah. I am. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so you can, you know, you can stretch yourself out to be full screen if you want. You know, there wow, you go. Wow, that's really full, neat. Full size Dr. Betts. <laughs> you can do what I do in my video. You can whoop, make yourself really tiny. Put yourself in the corner. Now, I used to put myself in the bottom right. I recommend top right now because as you're writing, as a human being, you tend to go from top left to bottom right. And you're, sometimes your, your image will get in the way. So I recommend to put yourself in the top right or the, or the bottom left. And then you can also bring in, say, a PowerPoint slide, which 
Uh, for some reason, it doesn't appear to be capturing it on the uh, display here. But you can capture windows, you can capture devices, you can capture any kind of thing that's on your computer. You can even capture display if you want to. So I'm just going to go ahead and do what's called a window capture. And I'm just going to find PowerPoint. Just pull up my PowerPoint window. And then you can see, uh, there we go. So here's my uh, PowerPoint presentation I did for my Spanish class. It was on Argentina. And you can resize this and you can do whatever you want in here. And I'll, um, let me just notice my webcam went away. That's because the OBS works similar to Photoshop in that it has layers. So I had, if one layer is on top of the other, it'll hide the bottom layer. So if I move the video capture device below the window capture, my, my uh, video camera disappears. And that, that kind of stuff happens. So you just have to play with it a little bit. But as you can see, here I am. And there's my um, content on my slide. Um, so far, I've only done maybe not even 10 mouse clicks yet. And I've gotten my slide up. I've gotten myself up. And the last thing that you, really, that you have to do is import your audio. And then you just, again, you click on the plus button here. And you look for what's called audio input. And then you can select whatever device you have. If you have built-in mic is what most people will probably use. So built-in microphone. And now you can see the little sound bars jumping on the bottom. Because OBS is now capturing sound and video at the same time. The really cool thing about OBS, at least in my opinion, is you can either record directly to your device, your computer, or whatnot, or you can stream directly to YouTube. You can actually live stream with this device, which is what a lot of gamers do. They use it for live streaming. And I've actually live streamed a couple of lectures just to see if I could do it, to see if we had the bandwidth available at uh, North Campus. Uh, we do. It's it's a struggle. The computer will struggle with it a little bit, uh, but it does work. I used a eight-year-old uh, iBook Air or what the, iMac Air or whatever they're called. So a really old, cheap computer uh, for Apple, cheap for Apple, that is. Um, and I got it to work. So we could, you could definitely live stream your lectures if you chose to, or you could live stream from your home uh, in this virtual environment. You could do a lot of things, uh, really cool things with this tool. Um, or you, know, you could also use Blackboard Collaborate to do similar things, but I think OBS uh, is a little bit more elegant to do that. And to, to live stream to YouTube is a whole other, a uh, whole other 20 minute discussion. It's, it's a little bit more challenging than just pushing the button. But once you have it set up, it's actually very, very simple to use. And uh, I actually have some videos on David Mind's uh, YouTube channel, Faculty, uh, Faculty Media Creation Hub, on how to set up OBS to do, uh, to do videos just like this. I, I personally think it's a very engaging way to do it because students can see you. And if they can see you, they're more relatable to you. And that, that to me, just helps a lot. And uh, it's really nice to get emails from students saying how much they really enjoy your content. And it's especially really nice to get email from students who are not from here. I got an email a week ago from a student who, claimed, uh, who said they were from Las Vegas and their, their professor went virtual for, for the same reasons we did. And the, his, their professor, I guess, was struggling with doing it. So her and her friends in her class were using my videos as supplements, which I thought was very cool. That's so. very cool. I have a question. So when you overlay the PowerPoint presentation, is it yes. just an image of that? Or are you actually then able to, is it a screen capture where you're actually able to go and show your PowerPoint now? Yes, yes I could scroll through it now and see if I can pull it up here. So I can scroll through all my slides. I could, I could tell it to you in Spanish if I had my notes. <laughs> But yeah, you can t you can totally scroll through it. Now you can't really draw on to on the uh, computer screen, uh, but if you have a tablet like an iPad Pro and probably uh, some kind of Lenovo tablet would do the same thing, uh, you can very easily use that to uh, draw on or write notes on your iPad Pro, and it'll broadcast to OBS directly. And in fact, the most recent update of OBS allows you to co connect your iPad Pro directly to OBS without going through a third-party software. It used to be you had to go through QuickTime to do it. And now it does it directly, which is really nice. It takes a lot of effort out of the, out of the uh, process. This is great. And I have one other question. Are you able to caption these videos? Uh, how do you mean caption? To, to, if you have a script for your video, are you able to put captions into it? Uh, sure, but uh, my advice would be to put your audio in directly. Because right now, if, if I were to record this video right now, OBS is recording audio at the same time as recording nope. video. Right, but I mean for accessibility purposes to have captions on the bottom of the screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would, I would, go ahead, David. Uh, 
Uh, for closed captioning, I'm sure uh, the easiest way to do that is once you upload it to YouTube, uh, they have the closed captioning features there. Yes. Which you, they do a, a decent job detecting it on their own. But if you have a, a script uh, typed out, it's uh, you can cut and paste it right in there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Russ, this is uh, really great. I haven't used OBS uh, yet, but I can uh, definitely um, – you know, see the value in it. Uh, there's so much research out there uh, that shows that, uh, you know, student success, both in courses and, um, you know, in terms of retention and completion, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, how well students are connected to uh, their college, both to their peers and, their, and to their instructors, it makes a huge difference. And little things like this, where they see their instructors, uh, you know, putting in the time, making their own videos, on the course content, um, you know, I think it's I think it's going to go a long way uh, with uh, helping our students out. So, really good job. Well, yeah, you. I really I appreciate that. that you showed this to us because, to be honest, I've been a little stressed out about how am I going to create my own videos for my class, and you just made it look so easy that now I'm going to jump right into it. So, thank you so much. Well, that's awesome. I'm really, really, really glad to hear that. I really am uh, excited to share this with people because I think it's a great tool, and you know, it's my favorite word, free. Um, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm more than willing to help any, any faculty member who wants to send me an email if they have a question about OBS. Uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but I, I do know quite a bit about it. Um, and I'm willing to help anyone who wants to learn it to, uh, to make videos. It's, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, so you've actually inspired me. I think that we're going to probably try to, and, and hopefully if you can help out, and maybe you too, David, will try to offer some professional development to um, you know, teach people how to use this software. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That would, that would be awesome. I, I actually taught uh, with on South Campus. I did a small uh, lecture with, I think, four or five faculty members on how to do just what we're doing now. And we actually went all the way to uploading on YouTube. Um, and it was it was very beneficial. There's a few faculty from that that are currently using OBS now in their in their cloud in their software. Uh, sorry, their video development, which is it's exciting when other faculty can can learn from you. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure. So we have a few more questions for you um, for the rest of our webinar. So the next question was, um, the transition to remote learning has been uncharted territory for all of us here at the college. What has been your greatest challenge, Dr. Betts, in the process to go remote? Uh, the great, greatest challenge so far has been testing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to do it appropriately to be fair to the students, but also to, to maintain academic integrity. Uh, it's definitely challenging. To do that, um, I don't. I guess we're going to find out today in our faculty meeting if we have some kind of honor lock to give to our remote students. Um, but I, that's the one thing I'm still finding quite challenging, and I'm, I'm willing to take any advice anyone has on how to do it. Um, do you to, want to speak to that, Belinda? I'm um, sure. Uh, well, it it all depends on the um, the assessment method. Um, there's a variety of options if it's a multiple choice exam for modifying the settings within D2L itself, but I know that it becomes concerning um, for some faculty that want to actually see the students. Um, so with Honor Lock, um, there is a live proctor, so that's something that gives reassurance a lot of times, um, but there's also some limitations like with having a webcam and whatnot that if students don't have that, there's other options like uh, Respondus Lockdown Browser that locks down the browser in order to prevent students from opening extra tabs. Um, and then other settings in D2L such as the, um, the time limit on exams, um, not leaving it open for students to take for like a couple hours or for you know a period of days um, to have a shorter window um, to allow students to come in and enter the exam within 15 minutes let's say and then take the exam and on average about a minute a question depending on the complexity of it um, those features um, help as well. However, with Honor Lock, um, we are, uh, you know, extending it out and um, considering the options of, you know, what struggles that students may have as far as technology-wide um, in order to be able to offer that. Great. Thanks for the information. I, it's exciting to hear. Is Honor Lock going to be offered over the summer for remote learning? It is, yeah. So it is, um, but they're also trying to identify um, whether students have webcams and the college was trying to order webcams, but um, the shipments are coming from China. 
And um, right now they're quite on back order. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of them will not be delivered till August. So um, they're trying to see the, um, the magnitude of how many students actually don't have webcams um, because if they have a desktop, then it doesn't come with a camera, but um, laptops do. Um, and, you know, seeing like what students actually need, you know, laptops still, um, not just for the webcam. So they're just kind of reevaluating that IT is, um, and hopefully they'll be able to give us more information on that. Um, but a start, a starter piece is to know um, the current inventory of your students technology um, to ask them in order to get prepared for whether you are able to get honor lock or not is dependent on what the students currently have. So that's definitely a good starting piece to, you know, mm -hmm. most faculty are doing surveys and just asking their students to see, mm -hmm. you know, do you have a desktop? Do you have a laptop? Do you have a Chromebook? Because um, a Chromebook you can't use Respondus Lockdown Browser with. So um, just knowing what um, technology they have is probably the number one thing to do. Um, but also, you know, there's um, certain instructors um, like for biochemistry or, you know, um, certain areas that are extremely high stakes um, and they're modifying their assessments um, to be more short answer, which I know it's a little bit more work for the instructor to have to hand grade it, but at the same time, it also allows um, the integrity of the exam to be more, um, you know, secure um, as opposed to multiple choice tests that students may share or the test bank may already be jeopardized, you know, so um, you can also have the option to possibly create your own questions if you have that or, um, you know, randomize it, do a pool of questions where no two students will have the mm -hmm. same exam or less likely to. So there's a lot of different options that you could consider. That's awesome. Thank you for telling me that. I'm glad to hear about the honor lock for the summer potentially being available. Thanks, Russ and Belinda, for that uh, assistance. Um, you know, as we you know just talked about, there have definitely been uh, some challenges uh, that uh, have popped up since we've uh, transitioned to remote learning. Um, but I'm sure that you will agree that there have been some positive surprises as well. What unex unexpected benefits have you experienced as a result of our transition to remote learning, Russ? Uh, one of the benefits for the remote learning is it, it forces me to be a little bit more creative in what I'm doing and how I'm engaging with my students. Um, what I I try to do, and I, I don't always succeed in doing this because I can be a little bit of a pessimist sometimes. Uh, David Perdine is actually the optimistic side of my personality. I go to him for my optimistic side. And uh, <laughs> I try to think like Dr. Perdine. I'm like, okay, what, what advantages can we get from being forced to go remote? And I'm trying just to, to be positive about it and then think of ways to deliver the material. And I've been doing, I think, fairly well with my delivery and I th just trying to make more engaging videos. And the, the, the trouble I'm having at this point with my engagement is that being at home, it's, it's, it's kind of not, I'm not in the game as much as I am when I'm in my office. So I'm, I'm, ho I'm hopeful that the, the campuses will open up again so we can go back to our offices um, so I can, be, I can feel like I'm in the game. But at home, I find it very rewarding to be able to to have students contact me to want to want to meet with me and and blackboard collaborate and they actually want to learn on their own they're still excited about the learning process which helps me to to stay excited and i truly feel that this remote environment is actually there's a lot we can do with it uh, even when the sessions go back to normal i think we still should take a lot of the lessons we're learning now and bring them into the normal session because um i th i think there's a lot we can do here i really do especially with video and uh, with with maybe some projects or stuff like stuff like that, perhaps even have students filming their own YouTube videos at some point would be would be really kind of cool. I just have to figure out how to do that kind of stuff. Um, so the positives would be is forcing me to be very creative in my delivery methods, uh, even more so than I have been, and I really do enjoy that. Um, and I really do enjoy the fact that uh, students are on their own with my guidance, still doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're still trying very hard to learn it. And they, in fact, they are learning it. It's, which is really kind of rewarding. Yeah, you're doing an amazing job with that. And I agree. I, I think that this, um, well, I'm a, a big advocate of turning problems into opportunities. And I really think that this has been an opportunity for so many of us to try out some things that maybe before we were hesitant or couldn't find the time. And now um, we're really, you know, getting, stepping out of our comfort zone a little bit. 
and trying things that, as you said, we'll be able to use in the future as well when we when we go back to a live setting. Absolutely. I, I really think we're going to learn a lot from this um, negative situation, turn it into a very big positive. And I think I'm hoping that a lot of faculty will will, uh, you know, learn from this as well, saying that we're, we all are learning from it and uh, start uh, thinking about other ways to deliver their material that, you know, more creative and uh, have a lot of fun with it. Because I mean, quite frankly, making video is it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. I think I'm singing your praise because um, that's uh, music to my ears for instructional design <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we definitely um, try to work with faculty as much as we can to help excel their courses and um, you know think outside the box and become creative with that. And I heard you mention about um, possibly um, needing assistance um, and we do have um, Norman who's actually hidden behind the scenes in this um, video um, that he's our multimedia specialist. So I'm sure that he'd be ecstatic to um, work with you. We also have instructional designers um, that have technology background as well. So um, I do think that this is a department that can help faculty um, with the um, eye-opening realization that, you know, there are, you know, times where we rely on the face-to-face -face a little too much. And now that we're forced to all be remote, um, and when we do go back to face to face, why not take something out of it and to be able to, um, you know, um, continue to enhance our courses is, is I think, an amazing opportunity to do. I absolutely agree. I think um, I think once faculty sees how easy it is to really put a lot of content online, especially video content, how you can make it look really good with with almost almost for free. Um, I think more faculty will be more inclined to try it. And especially if they know there's support from other faculty and, and tech, you know, tech support specialists like Norman, I, I think people will be more than happy to jump at it. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot we can do with video. And there's a lot we can do with the classroom setting. Uh, like for example, like my uh, uh, GOB chemistry, which is uh, general organic and biological chemistry for nurses or nursing students, they, um, my classroom is what I call a blended and flip class. So we meet once a week and it's flipped. So we do the homework in the classroom. So students watch my lecture videos, the one, basically the screenshot that I showed you of my video, they watch those every week. And I look at their notes every week and I give them a problem set every week. And we, we all work together to figure that problem set out in, you know, in, in small groups. And I love that, works, yeah. Oh, thank you. It works really well. And I think if, yeah. if other faculty were to understand how well this works, they might right. actually, especially science faculty, they may incorporate a little bit of that in their classroom. Maybe not entirely flipped, but at least a right. little bit. And I get a lot of positive feedback from students who said they, you know, they really like it because they can stop the video, rewind it. What did you just say? You know, and I even have parts of my videos like, okay, pause the video right now, answer this question on your own. And then right. some of them, some of them actually do it, which surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I love that, that, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's a cool environment to, to engage your students with. And, uh, uh, I get a lot of positive feedback. Now, I do tell them on the very first day that this is not a traditional course. And if you want a traditional lecture course where I'm going to stand in front of you and talk for an hour and 15 minutes, this is not the class for you. You know, go to a different section that's that's more traditional. And right. so far, nobody's left. And so far, no. pretty much everyone <laughs> says they, they once they get used to it, because it's different, they enjoy right. it. Right. They and I think it. they appreciate that you know, because you take the time to make it creative um, and to make it more engaging. Um, and I, you know, I think something that is always important is um, for educators to remember what it was like to be in that seat, you know, um, and it's definitely hard on students to sit there and just listen to someone talk consistently um, without having to, you know, engage at all in order to make them think. So all of the techniques that you're saying, it's amazing to um, allow students to be more successful in the class and especially with the flipped classroom. I think that's critical because areas that they may um, find that they have questions on, they don't realize that until they're at home and um, they don't have as many resources as they do in class with their classmates or with the instructor right there. So to be, to be able to flip it in that aspect where they're studying before they're coming to class and then when they come to class, they have the questions. It's a great opportunity, I think. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Russ, are you continuing that style now that we're in a remote environment? So are you giving the videos out ahead of time for students to watch and then maybe using breakout groups to have them work on their, their problem sets in class? I actually, I actually, what I normally would do is what you're saying is during class, I'd break them into groups and give them the problem set, a paper, a paper version of it. 
uh, what I did when the, we initially went remote was I put my problem sets all online immediately, so they all had access to it immediately. And I, I gave them the video, and I, and I just said, you know, you guys all know each other because basically by this time they all kind of have each other's phone numbers. I said, you know, text each other, work together as best you can. And I understand a lot of students during this situation have probably lost their jobs, so they're probably hustling to find another. So I don't make them work in groups because I'm not sure they can. But I do encourage group work because I think group work is the best way to learn chemistry and probably everything else. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't require a group work at this time. And uh, some students actually took the problem sets and ran with them. They finished them within two weeks. Uh, other students are still still finishing up their last problem set, even though their exam is tomorrow. But, you know, that's how it goes sometimes with students. And I get it. You know, they have jobs and they have families and they have, you know, a lot to do. So I, I understand what they're they're struggling with. At least I try to understand. And I want to mention something to your point about, you know, forgetting what the students are enduring while they're sitting there in the classroom. Um, this is why I encourage all faculty to take classes, you know, because as faculty members, we can take classes at Broward for almost for free. So I've taken, you know, sp I'm taking Spanish one right now. I've taken computer science. I've taken um, nice. scuba diving and things like that. But I think all faculty should, should take at least one, one lecture class a year to remember what it's like to be sitting there. And also to observe other faculty to say, okay, what are they doing that I'm not doing that makes this class really cool? Or what are they doing that they probably isn't a good idea? And I and I, maybe I won't incorporate that. Or if I'm doing it in my classroom, I'll eliminate it. Kind of stuff. Especially great, if, great. if, yeah. if, if yeah. power is going to pay for it. Come on. Right, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Um, so just the one last question that we have is, um, how do you feel that the content you teach is unique in addressing remote delivery? Uh, unique and hmm. Well, chemistry is unique in that everyone finds it hard. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like anything that you feel like you would you had to modify because of the specific subject that you teach that made it easier with your type of learners that you have. Um, well, fortunately for me, I didn't have to modify too much because I I already had a ton of my content online, and I was already uh, requiring students to use the online content as well as the That's in person great. content. Yeah. But I did, yeah. The big modification actually came in my organic chemistry class uh, because at this moment, uh, another faculty member and I, Sean Hamilton, are working together to make an organic chemistry uh, basically a workbook for our students on North Campus. And as part of that process, we were as building the workbook. We had you know problem sets for every student. And luckily, I had given them paper copies of the problem sets on the first day of class. So they, they all had all the copies of all the problem sets they had to do on the very first day. So that made things a little easier. but. I was as part of this process, Dr. Hamilton and I were going to basically answer all these problem set questions online on YouTube. And then as the problem sets became due, make the videos available. Um, unfortunately, we've had to uh, put that on hold because we don't have time at this moment. And I've had to focus on recording video for my students. And what you're going to find, and probably Norman will probably attest to this, is that the hardest thing about a YouTube video or a podcast or anything is your sound quality. And I don't have my good microphone at home. And I don't want to go to campus to get it because, you know, I don't want to get, you know, Corona. Right, they, they, right. they got me totally scared, you know, to go anywhere. <laughs> and uh, so I'm just using my uh, my headset mic and it doesn't give as good sound quality. And I, I'm i not an audiophile, but I do like to have good audio. And uh, unfortunately, my students have to endure the, the poor audio. But I am going to refilm everything when I get back to campus uh, to make it a lot more engaging and a lot more, a lot better sounding. And uh, actually, I also have a green screen in my office, so I can kind of, you know, incorporate the background. Of, oh, nice, uh, nice. Uh, it'll, it'll look a little yeah. sweeter, you know. It's fun. But hey, once you get into once you get into this YouTube video making stuff, you just start doing stuff just because it's fun. You know, it's kind of cool to put yourself in the background, you know, or put, <laughs> yeah. put you know put yourself in outer space or some crazy thing. <laughs> so I have one last question: Is there any advice you would give to your colleagues as they adjust their courses, especially since we're starting kind of a whole new ball game with starting our courses? in the remote learning environment instead of you know last semester where we were just kind of finishing out the rest of the term right great question well, what i would tell my fellow faculty is be open-minded and have fun with it this don't think of it as a negative think of it as a positive yes it's not as it's not what we're used to we're, we're used to going to the classroom and, and seeing students face to face but have fun just and try something try something new you know I've never used Blackboard Collaborate until now. I never saw the, the point of it for myself. But now that I've seen it, now that I've used it, I'm like, this is a great tool. I should have been using this all along. You know, I just, I just didn't pay attention to my fellow faculty who were using it. 
and that was a mistake on my part. I should have been listening to that because that's a it's a really awesome tool. Um, you know, make a video. Don't worry about how bad it looks. Just make one. Yeah. You know, it's YouTube. No one expects you to be a professional. You know, um, tell a joke. You know, misspeak, fall down. You know, do right. you know, don't worry about it. Just be yourself. Like for example, like when I was filming a lot of my videos, my office light would turn off because it's on a timer. And then I would lean back in my chair and wave my arms so that the light would turn back on. <laughs> I just left them in. My students, they all mentioned it to me. They all, they all just laughed. They said, that's awesome that you did. They didn't cut it out. You know? That's great. And my send-off line, all my videos have a send-off line. Every video I make has, a, has an intro line and a send-off line. My send-off is, hey, you know, at the end of this video, I want to wish you all good luck and good chemistry. See you soon. Cute. And all my students say, good luck and good chemistry. With my <laughs> so it's awesome. They're, they're watching till the end. A lot of them are. That's great. Yeah, I love that advice to not worry about being perfect, especially in this environment. You know, I have three small kids at home and literally they were just in here a second ago. Uh, luckily, my camera's not on. But, you know, there's been so many times where I get so worried or the kid's going to come in. And I think you're absolutely right that people just kind of appreciate the authenticity and, you know, understand that we're all in this together. And I think it's so much better to just make the effort and do what you can than to just say, you know, it's not going to be perfect, so I'm not going to do it. Right, right. Yeah, you can't you can't think that it's going to be perfect because it won't be. But it's exactly. going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, just always say to yourself, it's, it's going to be awesome. And this is going to work. And students, they, they love it because, hey, if your kids run in the room and start screaming, guess what? There's probably five other mothers that are watching that had the same thing happen to them just five minutes ago. And then so they breathe. You, yes, exactly. And you're instantly <laughs> relatable. You're instantly engageable. Yes. It's amazing. YouTube is an amazing tool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I do want to say thank you to both Dr. Betts and um, Dr. Perdian for joining us today. Um, your students are extremely lucky to, um, to have such passionate educators. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Russ, I want to personally thank you for agreeing to join us today. You know, as your uh, peer and friend, I've been so impressed by your professionalism, you know, innovation and creativity. Um, and, it, you know, it was my pleasure to be able to join you here with uh, Michelle and Belinda to spotlight all the great things you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. I definitely appreciate them. Yes, you're both extremely inspiring and just um, amazing role models for your students and for your, your colleagues here at the college. So this concludes our first episode of our webinar series, A Bird's Eye View. We look forward to highlighting more of our amazing Broward College faculty in the weeks to come. Thank you all for joining us.